This crisis has severely tested our government in multiple ways. Here are some of our key takeaways. One, we must be prepared to make the tough calls, especially in the midst of uncertainty and ambiguity. We have had to make many difficult and consequential choices over the past two years, often without an established playbook to guide us, nor the luxury to wait and see. We had to judge what was best at that point with incomplete information and act on that in the fog of war. Indecision or waiting for all the facts to come in would have been far worse. We didn't get every call right. We've had our share of challenges and setbacks these past two years. But the key is to keep on learning and improving, and as we discover more information, to be prepared to update, revise, or even reverse our decisions. For instance, at the start of the pandemic, when little was known of the virus, we had to make a judgment call. Whether to let the outbreak burn through our population and hope to reach safety through herd immunity, or to tighten up and keep our cases as low as possible until we learned how to keep our population safe. Letting the outbreak burn through carried the high risk of the virus spreading uncontrollably and causing many deaths, as happened in quite a few countries. But aiming for a zero COVID strategy in a small city state with no hinterland, unable to seal our borders completely, was both hard to do and incurred heavy economic and social costs. We determined right from the onset that we would not pay, we would not pay the high price in human lives. So we closed our borders, implemented strict measures, and for a time, imposed a circuit breaker. We did everything we could to prevent Singaporeans from being ravaged by the virus, and we kept ourselves safe until we could get everyone protected through vaccines and therapeutics that were then yet to be invented. Fortunately, up to now, we've managed to secure our overriding aim to protect precious lives and to prevent as many avoidable deaths as possible. A year later, when the highly infectious Delta variant emerged and arrived, we had to judge when and how to pivot from this strategy. Delta's infectiousness was making zero COVID less and less tenable. We knew we had to switch strategies soon, but how? While our national vaccination program was progressing well, a sizable portion of our population, especially the elderly, were still not yet protected from the virus. If we opened up too quickly, they would be at great risk. We therefore decided to hold the line for a few more months until nearly everyone had been vaccinated. In the meantime, we gritted our teeth and pressed hard to reach the remaining unvaccinated individuals and prepared our systems to deal with high but hopefully not seriously ill caseloads. We also had to change public mindsets. People had grown accustomed to low daily case counts and we had to assuage considerable public anxiety when daily cases rose after we eased up. COVID patients were also used to recovering in hospitals, and we had to urge them to recover at home. Fortunately, we executed the shift at just about the right time and coped well with the subsequent Delta, followed by the Omicron surges. Our healthcare system and workers came under considerable stress, but to their great credit, they held up and enabled us to transition towards living with COVID. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is that we must always look beyond the immediate problems, however pressing they may be, to anticipate and plan well ahead. Throughout COVID, we always had to think several bounds ahead and prepare for different contingencies. 
at a time when we had a few dozen daily cases and were doing a few hundred PCR tests a day. We started thinking about what would happen when we had hundreds of cases and needed to do thousands of PCR tests daily. We scrambled to order test kits, stockpile medical equipment, and ramp up our healthcare capacity. Later on, when our hospitals were seeing hundreds of Delta cases daily, we asked ourselves, how can we cope if we have thousands of cases a day? So we simplified healthcare protocols and built up our systems, processes, and capacity to handle a much huger scale of outbreak. These contingency plans and actions had to be made well in advance. If we had waited until cases actually surged before acting, it would have been much too late. Realistically, we can't prepare for every contingency, but we have to do the best we can. And that's very hard because we're usually already fully stretched dealing with the current fires. But being prepared and making investments early yields immense dividends, especially during a crisis. Sometimes we had to place bets and buy ourselves insurance and options even at substantial cost, like with vaccines. We knew that vaccines would be a game changer and that there would be a scramble for them when they became available. Long before that, we moved quickly to secure advanced commitments for vaccine supplies. We took calculated risks on promising vaccine candidates across different technologies. It cost us a tidy sum and we accepted that not every bet would pay off. But we judged this a small price to pay to protect Singaporeans and accelerate our move to the new normal. With therapeutics too, we had to make similar judgments, and I'm glad that these decisions overall have turned out well for us. As a team in charge, we need to judge when we should count every dollar and cent to make sure we get the best value for our money. But also, when it is worthwhile to pay a little bit more to buy insurance and options for the future to put us in a stronger position when the crisis worsens. The third lesson I draw is policy is implementation. As AOs, your task is not just to come up with ideas and concepts, write good papers, and push them through approval forums. You also have to implement and execute well, identify your priorities, and focus on the most urgent ones. Break these down into specific tasks, marshal the resources, organize the responses, and get all the agencies to work closely together to prevent any slip up in implementation. At the same time, you must also communicate engage as stakeholders, and get your message across to the public. Our national vaccination program was one such operation. It was not just about setting vaccination targets. We had to get out there to engage the public through all available communications channels, put out sound and credi cred credible medical advice, present information and facts transparently to dispel mistruths, Convince the public that the vaccines were safe and get people to come forward to get jabbed. We also needed to work out the last mile logistics to actually deliver the jabs into arms. Identify sites for vaccination operations, source for manpower, train them, develop the SOPs and the IT systems, and work through the process flow and different procedures for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. It was a massive operation. At the peak, 2,000 staff were running 40 vaccination centers island-wide, administering over 2 million jabs a month. Most people will recall a smooth experience and not realize the scale and complexity of these operations. But thank to the, thanks to these efforts, we have fully vaccinated 92% of our total population and achieved one of the highest rates of vaccination coverage in the world. During this pandemic, we've had to mount many other intensive operations, dealing with a dorm outbreak, 
securing essential supplies, ramping up contact tracing, managing testing and quarantine, or SHN, implementing the HRP, Home Recovery Program, and so many more. Each one was a major undertaking. Collectively, they stretched our resources to the limit. At times, we had to call in the SAF for assistance. But each operation illustrated how critical good execution on the ground was. As leaders in the admin service, you are not just the brains of the public service. Together with other public service leaders, you have to take command responsibility. Deal with the issues as whole of government. Marshal resources across the public and private sectors. Implement and improvise solutions. Roll up your sleeves to make the whole system work and get the job done. We've made significant progress in our fight against COVID-19. We are getting closer to the finish line, but still we cannot be sure that we are almost arriving. The virus has surprised us many times and will surely do so again. But overall, we are in a much better position and we can be quietly confident of dealing with whatever may come and continuing to progress towards the new normal. Key to our handling of the crisis has also been trust in the government. Trust that the government has the best interests of Singapore and Singaporeans at heart. Trust that the government is competent and will make the right decisions on behalf of Singaporeans. Singaporeans displayed that trust when they accepted the government's advice and decisions, when they complied willingly with strict SMMs, when they came forward to get vaccinated. This trust is precious. To continue to build and nurture it, we must have a top-notch public service with capable and committed officers, possessing the right ethos and values, dedicated to serving Singaporeans responsibly and honestly, to the best of your ability. We need first-class minds, able to grasp and tackle complex interconnected problems and come up with creative ideas and workable solutions. But we also need a first-class team, cohesive and mission-oriented, focused single-mindedly on getting the job done. But there's one more vital ingredient of success. For the public service to be able to do its job, it needs to work hand-in-glove with the political leadership. The ministers have to get the politics right, understand the key issues and identify your priorities, exercise their political mandate, set the direction and chart the country's strategy, but also be hands-on to ensure that policies are well designed and implemented. Then they can carry the decisions with the public, assure the population and lead Singapore throughout this journey. Just as importantly, the public leadership has to give, the political leadership has to give public servants the political support and cover that they need so that they can focus on their tasks, carry out your duties professionally, and not be distracted or intimidated by political theatrics or grandstanding. At, on your part, as leaders in the public service, you must appreciate the political context, translate overall strategy into workable policies, and implement and execute the plans. The political leadership and the public service must complement and support one another and trust each other to play their respective roles. And this partnership is crucial. As both our political leadership and public service leadership renew themselves, we must also renew the trust that exists between the current generation of ministers and senior public service officers and extend it into subsequent generations. COVID-19 was a moment when this happened. The whole 4G team was involved, one way or the other, working with their permanent secretaries and management teams. During the crisis, they strengthened their relationships and deepened their shared understanding and trust. This set the foundation for the next generation of leaders, both the ministers and the public service. Because when their turn comes to assume the responsibility of leading the country, the two will need to work just as closely, 
and deliver the same results that Singaporeans expect and have become used to.